Can you say a little bit about your stentrode neural ACE uh, research? Oh, sure. Um, we are just right at the beginning of human trials for that. So where we're at right now with that is scanning a lot of heads and making sure that um, everyone's vessel anatomy will actually uh, support this sort of technology. Um, when, you know, when we're talking about that valley of death in 17 years, this is one that I think even with our accelerated program, they're going to get, <laughs> start knocking on 17 years to get into a human because, well, to get into common clinical usage because it's super high risk. Um, Are you using that material like graphene so the body doesn't reject it? Or? No, it's, it's made out of the same material that, that a regular endovascular stent is made out of. Um, the uh, electrodes are made out of... Um, platinum iridium, I believe. Um, I, I didn't develop the tech, I'm just running a clinical trial for them, but I'm pretty sure it's platinum iridium. Um, and they have, we're going first in humans, so uh, they've, they've done, <laughs> they're an Australian company, so they've, they've put in about 90 sheep. Um, <laughs> with, uh, you, you can inject them into like as deep as the thalamus and stimulate and read. They haven't gotten it to the thalamus, okay. so they they're only going to superior sagittal sinus, which is a big vein, big target, um, right near the motor cortex, though. So you can think, you know, uh, the the way that we train the algorithm is think about opening and closing your hand, and we can record enough of a potential from that to power something. The way we confirmed that in a sheep is that we were tapping the sheep's foot and you could see the, the signal in the brain. Are you seeing researchers um, try to use neural networks to, to figure out what's happening there? So the field of brain-computer interface work um, does, we do end up using um, different machine learning algorithms to decode uh, from the, the biggest misconception about brain computer interface work is that we're working out how the brain does stuff. It's like, no, no, no. You're finding the cheapest and easiest way to record brain signal, and then you're getting the best algorithms to, um, to come up with something that can decode it into meaningful movement commands. So that's what we're trying to achieve with, with BCI. So um, sometimes it's a neural network, other times it, it's, it's something else altogether. Um, what they typically go for is the best performance and the you know the at the fastest pace. Are you imagining um, integrating this with VR at some point? Um, we were talking about actually the training process being potentially in VR, um, but really what we're with first step is get the communication system working. Second step is if we think we can get more than one degree of freedom, get a robotic arm on there and and see if we can get someone with ALS feeding themselves or picking up a cup or something like that. Um, not to make a joke, I'm completely serious, but like, are there people re seriously researching like adult VR content as t terms of, of, of potential for pain relief over above other applications? That's an interesting idea. I, I don't know. Is that something that you could research or something that's just too taboo? Uh, I don't think it's too taboo. I, I, um, I just don't know that anyone, it's, it's a clever idea, I okay. think. I mean, it, it's... It sounds frustrating. Can we volunteer for the protocol? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things, it's like... Um, I, the, in my, immediate, my immediate reaction to it is, um, is it practical to have an orgasm or nearly have an orgasm every time you want some pain relief? Because that's one of the things that we think about with VR as well. Is it actually practical, practical for you to have a Google Cardboard and pop something on your head, which is why a 2D solution would solve a lot of my problems if you could just pull out a phone and, and look at stuff. Um, well, if you're completely paralyzed, I mean, I don't imagine you'd be having an orgasm, but... It, well, uh, maybe, 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 maybe not, maybe. Yeah. yeah. So, but it's an interesting idea, definitely. Thank you. Oh, no worries. Yeah. You'll be publishing. No worries. Um, thank you for the talk. Oh, um, I'm Allison. I'm with the DMV Assistant Technical Director of the Vision Center. And I actually attended your talk for one reason, is that because uh, both of my siblings are disabled. One actually has RA, where she had both wrist and a spinal fusion. Um, she can't really move them at all. She, I told her I was coming to your talk, and she basically said, please take notes, because it's, it's kind of a living hell with the pain that she's in. Um, I didn't know, since I'm going to be graduating in May with a, a CGT background, um, I didn't know BCI was so far along, and I didn't know that the stuff that existed and what you're doing 
you know, is actually as far along as it is, do you have any advice for like a designer and a dev like me to kind of get into the BCI field? So the BCI field is, um, it's a tough one. Um, it's, uh, there's a couple of big players, you know, uh, so Brandgate is like this company out in Providence, Rhode Island that have, they have been sort of like going bankrupt and then sort of uh, becoming a company again for the last 20 years. Um, and, uh, but they're probably like the furthest along in terms of commercialization. They just put electrodes directly into the brain and they've got um, like people with ALS moving around high degree of freedom robotic arms and things like that. The issue with that, of course, is that you're sticking something directly into the brain. So high risk surgery, only a few people in the world know how to do it. And uh, it doesn't last forever. The, the electrodes scar over and then you need to take it out and put it in somewhere else. Um, but they're like the furthest along. Um, there's another guy by the name of Doug Weber out at UPMC. He is doing, in my opinion, the most expansive and best work of like um, trying out all the systems, implanting the most people per year. Um, you know, he's, he's the sort of font of knowledge. Like, so if you could get, go, and, go and work with Doug, he would be amazing. Then in terms of a design point of view, there's a guy called Jose Carmena, and he's doing um, the cool, he's answering the coolest questions as far as I'm concerned. So he's the guy who's like trying to work out how do we trick so, uh, how do we trick someone's sensory system into feeling something that the, the robot touches? And what is that going to look like? And what form is that going to take? And, um, and he would probably be the most design heavy guy um, out, of, out of everyone. Yeah. And, uh, sorry, the other name as well, Doug Hopkins? Doug no. Weber. Doug Weber, I'm sorry. Yeah. Did you happen to have their contact information? Uh, <laughs> Maybe in my phone. <laughs> but, I mean, you can Google them. Uh, yeah, uh, they're, they're very Googleable, all of them. I mean, and they're usually like, I, I forget where Jose is these days, but Doug is like, you know, doug.weber at upmc.edu, <laughs> like, or something. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, can I give you my card? Yeah. In case you think of anybody else. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. And I gotta go into that other talk. Right. Thank you no so worries. much. Have a good great one. Talk. Yeah, it's a good question. Where, where uh, that's what the next trial that starts in May is looking into. Um, the first pilot trial was a single dose. Mm -hmm. um, so we, what we did was, because we were on a hospital campus, we actually kept everyone on campus until their pain came back. And so it was a single, single dose of 10 minutes of VR. And we had people who were um, pain-free while they were in VR, but pain was back immediately once you took the goggles off, all the way through to one person was pain-free for four hours before coming back. But one of the things that we struggle with, and this is why we're, we're doing the larger clinical trial, is pain is like, it's a very hard thing to study. It's so subjective. You know, first of all, we don't have any objective measure. It's just how much does it hurt? <laughs> um, and then it's really susceptible to placebo effect as well. So placebo control in this trial has been really, our placebo control in the, the May trial is going to be a black screen. And I was like, even th that could be a therapy, you well, know, yeah. like <laughs> sit, sit, in, sit in blackness for 10 minutes. That, you know, <laughs> some people call that meditation. Yeah. <laughs> when, or when the, yeah, that's interesting because it wouldn't be a black screen with somebody like, guiding you through like some guided meditation like you're yeah. sitting in a pond well we, we but that's a therapy <laughs> yeah. so yeah. yeah we're trying to be like the uh, what is the most neutral thing we can give someone gotcha. that's not, yeah. not yeah. therapeutic but also not gonna create a negative bias where their pain gets worse yeah and that's going to be our placebo can I, um yeah can i can i ask a kind of naive question yeah. uh, i heard that if you cut your finger your your finger starts sending out a whole bunch of signals to your brain and people think that these signals are the correlation of pain is that Completely naive, or is there um, anything to that? No, no. I mean, you can. Uh, 
th this absolutely happens, and you can you can do nervous system recordings to um, to try to quantify how much pain someone is in. The problem is you need to do very uh, distributed recordings in order to actually understand what's going on. So, for instance. Um, this is a crazy experience that I, ha I, I just was lucky enough to have, but um, I, I did a lot of work in uh, deep, and still do, in deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. I don't know if you guys have ever seen videos of this, but basically put an electrode into someone's brain, they hit the right area, they turn on the stimulator, and the person's symptoms just stop. It's like a magic show. It's like, just stops. And one of the leading Parkinson's researchers who was doing this at the time, I was... I, I, did a little road trip in the UK and got to visit him, and uh, his name's Tipu Aziz, and you can you can look up this research. And he was looking into um, using deep brain stimulation for intractable pain, and so he had got an ethics approval to, to implant one lady, and she had um, she was uh, terminal pancreatic cancer, so her days were: do I take a whole bunch of pills and be completely out of it, or? Do I not take the pills and be able to have lucid conversations with my family? That was her daily sort of choice in her last like three months. So he put a stimulator in and I was in the room when he turned it on. And so she hasn't taken her meds. She's in 10 out of 10 pain. She's doubled over and she's just, you know, pain. You can just see it. And he turns the stimulator on and you see her just sort of relax and he says to her, okay, well, tell me about your pain levels. And she goes, oh, it's still 10 out of 10. I just don't care about it now oh. because he hadn't, he wasn't able to get to the deep brain structure that, that is sending the pain message, but he could get to the anterior cingulate cortex, which is the area of the brain that tells you how much you should care about the pain oh. stimulus coming up. So just tracking the nerve signal doesn't always tell you how much pain they're experiencing, which it's the same with like a Navy SEAL or something, you know, someone like that. They, they can just sort of sit there and go, yeah, it hurts. <laughs> you know, and they'll smile at you. <laughs> you know, so so it it gets again. It comes down to pain being super complicated. So um, on the same, uh, I had believed that maybe VR was helpful with pain because it was giving you an enormous amount of signals from basically immersing you in another world, and that was overwhelming your sensory input and drowning out the signal by quantity with new signals, and that was maybe why. Could be. So that's, that's the gate control theory of pain, um, where if you, create a, if you create a stimulus that is equal or greater to the painful stimulus, um, typically it's another painful stimulus, but that's a different story, but um, you, can, you can drown out the, the one that is currently salient. Um, so, you know, we're, we're thinking about VR as potentially a distraction. We're looking into that. That's you know in the in the trial that we start in May, but um, we're we're hoping that's not the case. We're hoping that we're actually retraining something with these somatic uh, videos, but maybe we're not. Maybe we're just distracting them, um, which is still cool. But it's uh, I I just I worry about how the longevity of that approach for someone with chronic pain. So hopefully hopefully not. Okay. <laughs> I just have a question real quick. Yeah. Uh, just uh, have you. Do you think this has any applications with people who suffer from chronic migraines? Or is this because of light is sort of like a problem for people who have migraines too? So I don't know if that's... We, we've, um, I was just about to say, we, we've had issues with... Uh, we just started a little bit with uh, TBI and we've had to put light levels way down um, to the point where um, I'm not even sure how useful it is because they're just... Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are there any signs of addictive cycles, uh, tolerance, or anything like that, uh, with the electrical, the electro uh, experiments in pain management that you've seen? Is there any sign that it could become addictive? That VR for, could become? No, for um, I'm sorry, invasive pain management strategies. Oh, invasive pain management strategies. Um, so, I don't think that too many people have done it. Um, they, I mean, they, they're out there. Um, it, it's a pretty extreme thing, though, you know. Um, so, so, you know, Tipu published that, that paper, and it, it's something that you can get done if you want it. But I have, you know, 
I haven't seen too many people actually opt in for it. Right. Um, so, so I don't know what the longevity of it is, yeah. Okay. Has there been any research on marrying VR and a normal like, pain medication course together to try and make it so it acts like it's stronger or it's more effective? Has there been, like, has there been any studies that have been doing the initial human studies? So, like, has there been any thoughts where, like, you know, pain medication is helping, but would this help even more on top of that? Mm. Um, there, there's been a couple of people who um, have paired VR, and it's a good question. I, I, people have paired VR with pain meds, but they usually measure efficacy in the drop in pain meds. So, um, so they, they haven't really, I guess they haven't honestly approached it as a combination therapy. They've, they've approached it as an add-on to see if they can reduce um, but I guess that does in some way answer the question that as a combination therapy, if we started all of our patients, rather than saying from the outset, here's some meds and that's all we can do for you, here's a Google Cardboard and some meds, and, and we'll start with the lowest possible dose and, and revisit if we need to. Um, yeah. Is it possible to combine VR with some uh, other therapeutic techniques like commitment behavior therapy? Um, I think that's a really good idea. Um, actually, the, the app that I showed at the beginning for suicide prevention, we've also published a couple of papers showing that that therapeutic technique works for chronic pain. Sorry, I missed the first oh, part. Oh, we, we, we've, uh, we use a, there's a cognitive ther uh, behavioral therapy technique that we've been using for treatment resistant depression called PATH, Problem Adaptation Therapy. Um, and we have also published on its efficacy in chronic pain. Wow. Uh, because a lot of, uh, in chronic pain, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the augmentation of the pain experienced can be through just poor emotion re regulation as the pain is coming on. Oh God, here it comes. And, and people experience it even more severely. And so um, what we were able to show is that regulating those emotions when they're coming on can actually reduce the amount of pain experienced in people with chronic pain. So I, I, I like the idea of pairing the two together. We haven't, we haven't done it yet. I'm sure someone has somewhere because... <laughs> there's, there's also EMDR too, right? EMDR. Uh, it's, that therapeutic, it's that therapy where they use oh, light yeah. as a gun. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes on yes. either side of the eye. We, we're doing that, uh, sorry, I, I always forget that it's EMDR. So yeah. Sana Health is the company that we're working with right now. They have a, they have a device. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, and uh, it's super interesting. So we have, um, we've got some really impressive pilot data with that. And I, the first time I saw it, I was like, well, this is voodoo. This is like <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> you, you put headphones in and, and it goes beep, beep, beep. And I'm like, yeah. this isn't gonna help shit. You know? yeah. <laughs> and then he said, well, try it out and lay down. Yeah. And I'm like a terrible sleeper and I just, fell asleep. <laughs> like, he didn't tell me it was, it was helping sleep, but I just fell fast asleep on the floor. And then we started giving it to people and they were like, with chronic pain, and they were like, this really helps. Cool. And um, I, I, I don't know what's going on there, but uh, there's, there's something. something there. Yeah. <laughs> EMDR? Uh, yeah, it's EMDR, yeah. but I can't, I can't remember the acronym. I, I, I call it. I call it. Uh, they're very uh, <laughs> uh, Buzzers. The, the company, the company that we're trialing is called Sana Health. They have S A N A. Yeah, they have a good web presence, so you can and and they show they link to publications on the the mechanism of the of the technique. So. Um, yeah. I'm getting ready to run here, but thank you for the talk. Oh no worries. Um, I'm working with the Medical College of Virginia. Okay. Uh, we're partnering like art school stuff with the medical school stuff. I'd love to follow up more with you on the. Please. Is yeah. Just like the link to Instagram is that the easiest or? Yep. Yep. Instagram or yeah. Um, I'm just David at Mount Sinai org. I move it desensitization and the reprocessing. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There it is. What do you think are the? Oh. Sorry. 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 No. 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 Thank you. Um, Oh, cool. Um, 
Yeah. So, uh, the vaccine that we are. Uh, Mm-hmm. We did a, we did something in house completely to start from scratch. Um, so it's it's like a little video. Where the kids put it on. Um, there's like this one point in the video where uh, it's like this machine would sh- shoot like a tattoo, like mm-hmm. a laser, onto the arm. Mm-hmm. The nurse could um, dedicate like a left arm or right arm for administration points, um, and it would coincide with that. Things counted down, and we mm-hmm. have a separate mobile app that goes with that to procedurally sort of um, generate this uh, experience for the kids. Um, how do you think that that might be regulated? No, I think that, so. This is <coughs> this is really interesting, and um, I don't know if you've have you heard of a company called Smiley Scope? Smiley Scope. Yeah. No. So really great company, same idea. Uh-huh. Um, and they actually have conducted the largest, to date, the largest randomized controlled trial of VR affecting needle pain and anxiety in children. Phenomenal study, like impeccable research. Um, We couldn't find a way to integrate them into our workflow, and this is like the most shameful thing about American healthcare ever. Like, there was no way to bill for it, you know? And so they were like, okay, we need to, we need to somehow find FDA, you know, some, some way to get the FDA, FDA to indicate that they need this. But the FDA kept pushing back saying, well, kids are getting injections all the time. Right. And, you know, they just toughen up and take it. So optimizing is not really... Yeah, it, there's no optimization. There's no cost saving unless you've got a real corner case of someone who needs to be sedated to take the injection. But that doesn't happen very often at all. So really, it was down to the only way Mount Sinai could, and this is the part of the job that I hate the most, but the only way that Mount Sinai could even approach the idea that maybe this would work was a, a recruitment tool. Like, this is why you come to Mount Sinai, because we've got the... So it's like a marketing tool. Yeah. yeah, it's total marketing. We got oh we got VR and the kid wasn't bothered my, my kid wasn't bothered by the vaccine at all which I think is is genius but the price point for Smiley Scope was too high for that um, because they were like it was like I don't know it was like a thousand bucks and then um, you know some sort of monthly subscription and they and and I was sympathetic to that because they were like well this is what we actually need for our business model to be sustainable but I was like yeah, but also have you tried just giving it for five bucks and yeah and seeing if you can get a 1,000 hospitals to use it tomorrow. Do you think it would help with adding on to your comments around that we have kind of pushing back to your um, Do you think having like robust clinical trials and you know, having an actual structured study on this would help them sort of be sort of? Well, uh, you need, yes, but you need to find the right outcome measure because that's, Smiley Scope did that. They published, I think it was in JAMA, like it, it was like a re- they, they recruited 350 kids oh, yeah. They showed, it was a randomized control, randomized placebo controlled trial. They showed, it was outrageous. They showed a 50% reduction in anxiety and an 85% reduction in pain. It was like real, real numbers, you know. Um, But the FDA still shrugged and was like, yeah, but like the kids are still taking their their needles, you know. Um, (laughs) And that's the problem. and, And it's not, you know, like, I, 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 again, I'm, I'm sympathetic to both sides because it's awesome, but I'm also like, well, do we really want to make healthcare more expensive here? Right. Like, because, so I think what we need is the price points to go down. Like, you can't be selling us a thousand dollar headset and then like, uh, it was like a hundred dollar a month subscription yeah. per, per device. That's not, That's not sustainable for a hospital just to have a better experience, mm-hmm. you know? But if you were like, just pay five bucks a month, you know, and download it on your your own phone or, or something like that. Maybe that would be sustainable. Maybe a lot of doctors would say, "Well, this is a practice differentiator for me, so I will do it." You know. Okay. Thanks yeah. so much. Oh, no worries. I'll definitely want to send you like a demo kit or something. Yeah, no, that'd be awesome. We we love we love demoing. Yeah, <laughs> we do. Awesome. So. I work with a company called Bionic Eye Technologies, and uh, we do a few things. One of them is that we're working on an implant for uh, the eye for people with macular degeneration. 
And um, that's our long-term plan, but in the short-term plan, we're trying to work on uh, more uh, diagnostic tools for uh, testing using VR. And I was wondering if there's anything you guys are doing that would require any sort of FDA regulation with VR headsets. And if so, how you're approaching that in any sort of scenario. And if not, you're looking for somebody? <laughs> <laughs>